when people talk about uh, fusion, it's gotten a real bad rap lately, that it's, it's basically just a lot of soloing over, over one chord. But you are truly a fusion player in the real meaning of the word, is that, that you melt together blues and bebop and rock and the New Orleans and all sorts of stuff. So the Don't forget jazz. Oh, jazz, <laughs> of course. <laughs> so so uh, the obvious question is, is, how did you develop this kind of style? Well, I never consciously brought in, you know, different kind of musics to come together at all, but uh, I guess uh, really when I started playing, you know, really becoming aware of jazz was the very, you know, like 1969, 1970, I went to Berkeley School, and uh, I think I started really getting into jazz around 68, and there wasn't any fusion then, you know, it was just like there, were, there was jazz and, and the whole thing. And then Miles started to play In a Silent Way and Bitches yeah. Brew. And now looking back, that's fusion. But at the time, I never, uh, you know, thought of being anything other than playing jazz music on the guitar. But I had started out playing blues. I, I really loved, uh, you know, Chicago blues and Muddy Waters and all that stuff. So when I, and then, you know, I spent a long time at Berkeley with a big fat jazz guitar and, and copying, you know, my idols, uh, Jim Hall and Wes Montgomery and all those guys. And uh, I was so in love with uh, sort of jazz from the 60s that really didn't have guitar players in the groups like Coltrane's group or Miles or, you know, before Bitches Brew and, uh, and all that, that when I... I started later on, started to, to play in bands that were playing the kind of expressive music that I wanted to play. I found that, you know, I went back to some of my rock or blues beginnings to use more of a distorted sound and uh, bending notes and stuff like that. And uh, so I guess that's a fusion of, mm -hmm. of, uh, of, you know, jazz guitar technique with what has become rock and roll guitar technique, which really started from the blues guys, from, you know, when B.B. King and those guys started to bend notes and play the blues like they sang it on the guitar. Yeah. There are a lot of guitar players that I really love, you know, and people ask me who my influences are, and I end up, uh, I mean, even though somebody, maybe you didn't copy them so much, right. you, you learn so much from just hearing somebody play really well. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of, like Jim Hall, even though actually I did copy him when I was younger. If people heard me, I mean, when people hear me on this tape, they're going to maybe say, God, it has nothing to do with Jim Hall to them. But uh, you, you get so much just from learning about, you know, from seeing anybody play the guitar really well in, in you know, in the jazz idiom, like Django Reinhardt or, or Charlie Christian or Wes Montgomery, any of those guys. So how does someone that's really locked into position playing or, or shape mm -hmm. playing, how, how would you suggest that they start developing that musical aspect? As far as playing the guitar and trying to get away from down and up position right. playing, I, I mean, I, I guess what ha happened to me was that you learn out of necessity because certain things don't fall under, in position, you know? So the more you learn about playing the guitar, the more you go out of position, you go up and down mm -hmm. instead of across a lot of times. Yeah. And uh, this, for me, happened pretty naturally, I think. But, but I got to tell everybody, I can't remember what <laughs> happened when I was 18. You know, a lot of stuff I've forgotten, how I actually got to that point. But, uh, you know, you, you try and think of all the possibilities of ways to play something. Um, but once you start learning a tune, I know learning... Charlie Parker's heads, you know, mm -hmm. trying to learn some of those pieces. Uh, you couldn't play them in one position, so you came up with this other way to play a musical phrase that was actually easier, and then you just use that in your improvising, you know? And, and I, well, I was telling you this the other day, that when I first noticed that guys like George Benson would play primarily with three fingers right. and play a lot of sophisticated music, and, and see him, people play up and down the neck, there's a lot of better ways to get to some things than, than just playing across. Yeah. You, you, you know? mentioned that, that there's nothing wrong with finding the easiest way to learn. Well, to it's play. actually <laughs> the best way. Yeah. I mean, if you sit around and think of all the possible fingerings for everything you do, you're wasting a lot of time. Yeah. You know, get a, I, I think making music right from the inception, even before, I mean, I don't think you're ever going to feel like you've mastered the guitar. Right. Um, but 
the easiest way is, is most times the best way because mm -hmm. you can get to it. And the whole thing about what I do is improvising. You know, you want it to, it has to be easy because what you're trying to do is play music, you know, and to have that come through you. Um, a problem that very many guitar players have is playing. <laughs> <laughs> playing, right. <laughs> is actually playing um, horizontally up the neck. And it's mm -hmm. something that you do with great facility. And, uh, you know, rock players are, are, are locked in their five boxes, and yeah. jazz players are locked in their positions or fingering mm -hmm. positions. And yet you transcend that and you just play all over the neck. Well, you know, it looks like that. <laughs> oh, that's cold. But, I'm, but, you know, I'm locked into playing all over the neck. <laughs> But, no, nobody knows all the positions. Right. I mean, anybody can sit and figure out a million different ways to play something, but I, I think that's how you get to it, is by just thinking about it. Thinking about how to get the best sound out of the guitar and the easiest way to play a phrase. Yeah. Well, you know, the piano is so linear mm -hmm. like that. It's e so much easier to play on a keyboard because down is down and up right. is up. So, but this, that, can you do that a little bit on the guitar, too. Um, even though it's hard to to play just, you know, like this with one right, finger sure. up and down, it does give you the feeling that you know you're going up when you go like that. Yeah. But if, I mean, one, one thing is, uh, if I just use the, the G string and the B string, but play kind of in the key of C diatonic or, or whatever progression. <laughs> That might be a more natural way for me, anyway, to play that. But then I, you know, so, so learning little boxes yeah. moving around like that. So you, you basically kind of went from C then to like an A7th to D yeah. minor, that kind that of thing, That sort of right? thing, and then, yeah. and then an E flat diminished to E, to e minor to F, to F sharp diminished to G7, to G sharp diminished to A minor, to yeah. B minor 7 flat 5 to C. I think that that's that yeah. kind of progression, right, right. you know. So, so that's how you would suggest the guitar players start working their way out of those, yeah, those boxes? Yeah, to just play, yeah. Or to do it without the passing chords. Right. But just... And that's just like running, that. yeah, uh, yeah, the diatonic arpeggios. Yeah, yeah. 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 And then just, yeah, getting stuff around like that. You yeah, know? you do that one more time a little slower.
Uh, loud jazz is another kind of extravaganza. It's in three, which makes it a little different and nice. Um, but it's, it's got this song form. <laughs> I took the, the, the chords from the end of the song and moved them around chromatically to make this B section, which is a setup for Dennis to solo over. But it's... So that's, it's, it's related to the last four bars of the song form yeah. part of the thing. So, so this is another tune that you set up Dennis to, to, yeah, to this, really play. Yeah, this was a, another over. set up for yeah. Dennis to really Yeah, while well, you and Gary play this really neat figure. Um, could you tell me a little bit about this C over B chord in the, uh, in the third bar of the A section? Yeah. That's a... How, how would that... Well, this whole thing is... is Contrary motion, the E flat triad with A in the bass. And contrary motion being... And then the triad goes down, but the bass line goes up. The triad goes down a minor third, mm -hmm. and the bass note goes up a major second. So it's... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yeah, just uh, some movement. It's a neat move. Yeah, I, I like that. Can I ask you to play that figure that you and Gary do over uh, Dennis's solo just a little slower, if you don't mind? Yeah. One, two, three. Except for the last three chords, it's all either minor chords mm -hmm. or this kind of right. like E with G sharp in the bass. Yeah, and yeah. I also notice that like when you move, when you move, um, say like a passage, an ascending passage mm -hmm. of, of chords, you'll pop the th hook the thumb over and do it. Yeah, right, like sure. Right. Well, on loud jazz. Yeah, exactly. Maybe you could show that a little slower, and, and then so that's like an F sharp minor to. Well, oh, there's seven. there's that E seventh over. Yeah. Use it, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that you know it's there. That's very you cool. Use that thumb. Yeah. yeah. I'm really intrigued about that that voicing that that's found in so many of your songs in this era. That that uh, E flat with the G in the bass. Could, could you expound on that a little bit? Is that like a a, a gospel kind of? Well, thing yeah, or? I guess it is. But I guess it is kind of. It's it's really just a triad with a third of bass in the bass. You know? Yeah. That's uh, amazing, amazing grace, grace, right? right but, sure. But that just has the the the, the tonic going to the third. Yeah. So it's it's just something that comes up a lot. But yeah. you don't have to start on the tonic. Right. You just start on that. That's what makes your stuff so hip because you you throw that right. Yeah, I I, I guess I've just about soaked that chord as much as I can. <laughs> but it's certainly I didn't invent it. It's, no, it's right. all over the place in pop music, you know. I guess the main concern is, say, a student or someone who's just learning to play jazz, what's that next step that that person can take to break away from, from that kind of student mode and, and to, mm -hmm. and to uh, really hone in on the, the improvisation? Yeah, to really yeah. To be able to do something with it. Yeah. Well, I always, you know, I mean, I, I bet a lot of people out there have played 
you know, some blues and felt like they were really playing and had some freedom with it and could be expressive, but then when they had to play on different material, they felt completely constricted. Right. And I think it's one, one thing is to try to, you know, understand the material you're playing and play it long enough, you know, like the chord progression mm -hmm. you're going to try and improvise right. over or whatever, so that if you can actually get to the point where it's like, it's as natural as a blues, you know, yeah. which means hearing it means getting it in your ears, you know, getting these right. phrases so that you can uh, hear them. Got to develop the ear, right? And, uh, yeah. yeah how, did, how did you, um, just by listening or by... Uh, Any way, shape, or form. Anyway. Trying to hear intervals. Yeah. Trying to be able to, to recognize intervals, you know, and... and that, you know, that's a, like a real uh, uh, neat thing about your playing is that you hear uh, pitches uh, in, in a scale that most players wouldn't really hear that readily. For example, you would hear the sharp 11th or you would hear the sharp 5 and you would integrate that into your style with great facility. Um, and I was wondering if there are any, any ideas you might have that, that uh, someone might, for someone else to, to integrate those kind of pitches into their playing. Well, you know, the way I integrated certain pitches into my playing was from listening to, to music where that was pretty common, and not, you know, or, you know, because when you get into, I was so influenced by Miles Davis and, and, and Coltrane and, and Bill Evans and, the, and these guys and records that they made in the 60s. I mean, so it really, I mean, I had a lot of records and still, you know, and so listening to this stuff all the time. So it might be less common to somebody who's kind of more into rock. Right. You know, they would think, oh, that's a far out interval. But if you, if you really become a, a jazz fan and listening to bebop records yeah. all the time, and, you know, the flatted fifth is really common. You know, mm -hmm. as a matter of fact, Miles told me once, you know, got to stop playing that flatted fifth, man. That's an old <laughs> cliche from 1949. So it's yeah. all relative. Right. But I think you can sit down and, and, and analytically look at intervals and just try and, and, and be able to recognize all of them, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, because there's a, a finite amount. And, and you just do that by practicing yeah, you know, thirds, like, fourths. Yeah, well, also, so you know, you can have a friend say, you know, okay, what's that interval, yeah. you know? Or, you know, and then move the, the root around. So, I mean, Fifth move the... flat seven. Very good. Oscar, oh, my God. Man. That's it. Lucky guess, John. That's right. Very good. And, and you know, <laughs> yeah, things so, like but, that. But stuff like that. You know, and, and uh, do that with your friends. Like, we used to do that all the time. Yeah. That's a great. That's a great thing that, that you just trade intervals back and forth yeah, and uh, until yeah. you'd be able to hear anything, right? Yeah. I, I and then and also you kind of you work on it. You get real good at it. And, and uh, I haven't worked on it in so long. I, I probably am not as good as uh, as yeah. I was. You know. But but you, you could see how. Don't it was, test me. In other no, words, I, I'm I'm don't please. Test you. <laughs> no, but say someone who hears this kind of chord. No, no, the, the C major seven sharp five. Right? That's what I was going to say. Guess, Anna. <laughs> but it, it it doesn't sound very. Uh, consonant when you first hear it. Right. right. It's, it's, it's harder than right. C major 7, which we've learned to we've learned to recognize that one. Yeah. Well, you sit there with a the chord and play it enough, you'll get it in your, in your ear. Mm -hmm. you know? when, when you play C major 7 sharp 5, for example, do you see it as a C major 7 sharp 5 or as a, a E triad over a C bass? Or do you see it as an A melodic minor third degree kind well, of thing? Well, I definitely or? don't see it as an A melodic minor. I mean, the whole idea of... I mean, maybe I realize that my hands are in the same place yeah. when I'm going to play a scale that works over that right. as A melodic minor. But uh, I try... I, I hear it as C major 7 sharp yeah. 5. Yeah. I hear it as C with a, a raised fifth. It's kind of neat. And it just takes a long time before you do that. But that's a hard one, you know. Yeah. So you, you basically hear major, minor, and dominant. You, you basically yeah. reduce it just to those three. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much, and that's just a major with an alteration. You know? yeah. yeah, I'm always thinking major, minor, dominant, mm -hmm. diminished. Right. But diminished could be kind of like dominant, too, but most diminishes. Yeah. I, th I think we should mention that, that uh, anyone who wants to learn more about the scales and the modes should check out your first video because you cover that yeah, in depth. And, yeah, my first video, and also... Uh, this has become common practice in, in jazz education or just music education to run these scales down. You know, I certainly didn't invent them. Yeah. You know, they were around a long time before I was. Um, so there's a lot of places to get 
to knowledge about scales right, from. Right. Do you have any devices that you rely on? For example, you're, you're, you're blowing and then you kind of maybe run out of stuff uh -huh. to play. Do you, do you ever rely on anything to get you out of a jam? Or Well, um, I'm sure I do. and uh, I hear a butt coming. <laughs> well, I'm not going to tell you, you know, because then every time I played it, then those people would say, ah, there he goes. He's not really playing. He's going back. But they know anyway, those, those people. But... Um, you know, the thing is, I try to not play those things. I don't have, you know, there's no, to t you know, the idea that, that you would have some stuff that would really work when you run out of ideas, that doesn't, that's not it. You know, you yeah. got to, the stuff that you fall back on is the most boring stuff, you know. Right. And for those, and, the, and those things when you're falling back, um, even though everybody does it, those cliches and stuff, you know, when you think about it, I mean, it's almost like you're asking me, is there some good stuff to work when you're not really... You know, yeah. you have any good stuff that always works? Right. Uh uh. You know, it's not, it doesn't work like that. What really works is to try and improvise. And, uh, and that's a painful thing, you know. That means you have to actually stop and sort of be befuddled for a minute. But I hear that in players that I really like, and, it, and, and, and I hear that kind of, of uh, going for it, you know, to play an idea that doesn't work and then stop and go for something else. And, you know, it's a constant, um, when you're improvising, it's a constant uh, battle to, n to not play cliches. Another thing I want to talk about your style is the rhythmic aspect in mm -hmm. your soloing. I think that's a really important thing we should, we should talk about. Mm -hmm. um, how, how you phrase the rhythm is just as important as the notes that you choose. Yeah, well, that's, that's it. You said it right there. Some people think the rhythm's even more important. And in the kind of music that we're playing, you know, I mean, actually, maybe so. I mean, rhythm and notes, they almost are the same. They almost go hand in hand. I mean, the rhythm just means the spacing and the length of the note and where it falls in relation to the other notes and to the other music around you. There can be rhythm even when you're playing out of time. And there is always rhythm to what you play. But um, to check out, I mean, the rhythm of the uh, of the phrases and where they fall on the beat is is so important and and you can't play without it so yeah. start the study of rhythm right and how now. do you how do you do that how do you develop it's just that? the same way i mean you know just by by you know you're on the beat or off the beat you know <laughs> on one or on the and of one and and yeah. different phrases and did you, did you ever practice go. with the metronome? I yeah, I used to practice that, with the metronome on, on different places, yeah. yeah and of. then I stopped doing it so much because I found that sometimes I'd rely on it. And then when you went to play with real drummers, they weren't playing the metronome. They were playing musical ideas, too. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, rhythm is melodic. Rhythm can be melodic, you know. And da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-
I've written two versions of the Wabash Cannonball, but I didn't mean from <laughs> any of them to be the Wabash Cannonball. Right. But uh, the tune Wabash, uh, which is this bass line. <laughs> Cannonball, <laughs> but you know, so the old country western tune thing about it that I found interesting was uh, that it moves like G7 for three bars, C7 for one, D7 for three bars, G for one. So it's a three bar phrase and a one bar phrase, right? You know, and it's just a little, little bit different. Yeah. It's how to, how to take one, four, five, one and, and just and make it a little, a little bit twist different. On yeah, it. the first bar, uh, the first two bars actually, um, are basically a G blues scale, but the way you displace the notes doesn't make it sound like a, like a traditional blues scale. It's, it's kind of really neat. Good. I don't know how, why that doesn't sound as traditional as it could, but I think it's it because of that first that first interval that uh, yeah that 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 yeah I play that a lot. That's one of my cliches. Just you got to slow it down then. Just slow it down. Yes. Yeah, the, the real neat thing about that section is is that I guess that the first interval, that cliche of yours, is, is what doesn't make it sound like a traditional. Well, it's blue. a big interval. Yeah. 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 That minor seven yeah. thing, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, is there a certain way you play it? Do you? I, I think okay. Well, you play it first. See, see yeah. If you keep your first finger barred over the third fret, then you can get it. Right. Then you get more of a legato thing. Much exactly. easier. Yeah. Much easier. <laughs> it just, it's, it's again, it's easier because you don't have to move your first finger. Yeah. So you learn something every day, that's great. Yeah, yeah, well, it's that, really great. Yeah, I just, it, it's, it's and great. this thing just came from, you know, I do a lot of stuff where, you know, I'll be in like in one position, but just skip a string. Yeah? I mean, like instead like of what going... What do you mean, for example? There's always a string in between. Yeah, yeah, I can see that, yeah. Yeah, so that's what gives it that, that kind of inner valley. It's just big, big intervals. Big intervals, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to see if... Yeah. I'm trying, <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to see if, you, if, you're, if you're, like, doing that first finger thing throughout, you know, that kind of, kind of quasi-bar thing when you... Well, yeah. Another thing I noticed is that you won't play notes on the same fret uh, with the, with like the third finger. You'll use a third and a fourth finger instead. Well, that's like a yeah, like that kind of thing, right? Instead of playing it with your third finger, as most rockers would play it, right? Yeah. Well, it just cool. makes it for more definition. Yeah. To have. yeah. 
but it's a little easier somehow. We just heard a great version of Make Me, and um, I was wondering if you could show us the, the A section to it. So you start on that sixth, right? You know? And then a chromatic thing. Cool. Cool. That's a, one of my cliches. Another one! And when you write your licks out and they become the head, then you can't play them in your solos as much anymore because people know about them too much. So a good yeah. way to get rid of your licks is make Put a head up <laughs> out of them. <laughs> That's cool.
It's it's a great head, you know. It's it's a do do it just a little slower if you don't mind. Okay. Now, now you'll have people playing the head of your tune in their solos, thinking they're really good, cool. Good for them. <laughs> yeah. It's all, you know, it's all kind of from uh, wherever that, you know. Yeah, right. The, first guy the, the, the classic blues thing, yeah. Or, or if you take out the middle note. But it's just sixth. Sixth. Prevalent thing to use yeah. a lot of six. The six six are, are great. Six yeah. are really great. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
sure a lot of people ask you about your right hand technique. Maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Um, yeah, I, I use my right hand <laughs> and uh, to pick the guitar with. But it's, uh, I use the fingers, but I, I play with a pick mostly. But a lot of times I don't want to have this sound when I play a chord. You know, when you're strumming the guitar, it's always going to sound like a strum, no matter what. So, you want to pluck it, so I just tuck my pick inside there. And then I can, can pick like that, do a little finger stuff, yeah. where, so that all the notes ring at once, more yeah. like on the piano. Did you uh, study any classical guitar earlier to get the right hand technique, or is that just something you just no, uh, I never, adapted? I never studied classical guitar. I, I had a classical guitar for a while, and uh, I, I studied a couple of Bach pieces, but I never really did it, you know, yeah. a lot. No, I, this just came out of a playing around mm -hmm. in the living room and, and at home and, and yeah. liking the sound of mm -hmm. of that, you know. I mean, do you ever also, use a thumb I mean, when you play, or, or just for effect? Or I notice you do that on the I, funk stuff. Yeah, yeah the yeah, funk yeah. stuff I'll, I'll do, which is between these two, you know. Mm -hmm. And then I guess for octaves maybe I would. I guess I would, yeah. But sometimes I play just like that too. I, I also noticed that that you use a lot of tenths in your playing, meaning the the root, and then the third, an octave above the root. Right. So uh, it's it's really prevalent in your in your chord melody playing. Maybe you could. Uh... Well, I. Uh, you know, when you play everything in block chords, it's very difficult, you know. Um, right. Something like that. But you can play some of these tunes and, and outline the harmonies without quite so much uh, jumping around. Um, it's body and soul, right? So there was, you know, didn't play one chord, but Man, it, but it had the roots in there, you know. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes that turns out to be a tenth. Yeah, right. right. All right. It just comes grabbing the yeah. root, trying to grab yeah. the root under there. Yeah. It, it's so neat. It's so much more open than that real dense kind of block chord melody style. Uh -huh. It's just very airy. Yeah, it's yeah. a nice thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was going to ask you, maybe you can just show uh, the tenths um, going up a scale for us. Yeah. In C major? Yeah, fine. Again. Yeah. <laughs> 
celebrate. <laughs> yeah, needless to say, you have to play them in all keys and, and work the fingerings out and everything. But you can hear, you know, any of the great improvisers. When Sonny Rollins used to take cadenzas by himself, you know, he would be able to outline the whole tune yeah. in, with just the saxophone without any chords. Yeah. So. I think a tune like All the Things You Are is really cool because you really have that movement in the melody and with, with the... Uh, right, the, yeah. yeah. Well, it's a great progression, yeah. you know. Could you uh, show that to us? Fun, fun progression. It's yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's like the <laughs> one of the classic progressions, right? The uh, five, the five to one kind of deal happening all over. Yeah, the a lot of well, nice. Yeah, it's yeah. got it's got diminished chords. Yeah, We've got uh, major chords, minor chords, dominant chords. It's got all kinds of yeah. chords in there. The neat thing about playing in that style is like like we mentioned is that even though you're not playing any chord per se, you, you're hearing the movement so strongly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You're also adding uh, neighbor tones and stuff too, as well. Uh -huh. and that, that's just stuff you just happen to hear that surrounds yeah, the well, actual. You know, I've experimented with this song enough, mm -hmm. so I know I can approach from a half step above or below or right. whatever, you know. Right. And and you try to land on a chord tone, like on the third, or or I guess at this point there are no rules as we've been saying. No, but I mean you want it to sound right, yeah. so you would probably be correct in saying that you know you hit a you want to land on a chord tone, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 